so so let's go through this uh, step by step so it says you start by finding a star and uh, for the exercises here imagine we are observing a strong absorption line at this and this number is randomized your um, thing might be different <laughs> um, determined by taking an average over the course of the year and uh, and this is the description of doppler shift as sometimes we see the wavelength longer as sometimes we see the wavelength shorter and um, one will be the red shift, the other will be the blue shift. And um, so for the first question, it's giving us this parameter, which is defined in terms of wavelengths. Uh, it's asking, what is the value of T? Okay, let's do the calculation. Um, so, so we need the size of the difference between the detected wavelength and the original wavelength. Um, okay, I guess I will just pick one. 486.227, 486.227, subtract uh, this number, 486.185, that's the difference in wavelength, delta lambda, and divided by the original wavelength, uh, divided by 486.185. Okay, oh wow, that is a quite small number. Uh, okay. So 8.64, uh, 10 to the power of minus five. Um, 8.64, 10 to the power of minus five. Okay, that I think is right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, this is giving the explanation of the steps that you should have gone through. And by the way, uh, when it gives the answer here, it'll be a little bit different because um, uh, some of the numbers shown here are kind of rounded numbers. <laughs> and, uh, so it, so as long as your answer is within 1% to 5% of the numbers shown here, you're doing fine, nothing wrong. Um, so, so yeah, you, you can calculate. So this is the way we did it. You can actually do it the other way, and um, it should yield the exact same t. Um, OK, this parameter is related to the speed of moving object by this relationship. Um, this comes from, a, um, I think in the textbook, uh, it's a given, this is the e equation or expression that you might see somewhere in the examples of the textbook in chapter five, that uh, T is equal to uh, V over C. Or actually, I guess the textbook doesn't, in that portion, they don't use the parameter T, they just say V over C is equal to Delta Lambda over Lambda naught. And so this is the relationship that I'm referring to. And you solve this for V to get this. So, um, so yeah, we were given C here. So we just multiply that to our calculated G to get the speed. Um, so I already have the G that is still in the calculator. Let's multiply by speed of light. And I'm checking the units to be sure. So the final unit we want is kilometers per second. And the question was nice enough to give it in kilometers per second already. So multiply by 299.792 kilometers per second. So we get 25.9 kilometers per second. Okay. Um, kilometers per second. Oh, I guess that's actually pretty fast. Because um, <laughs> uh, 25 meters per second would be like uh, 50 miles per hour. So that's a thousand times 50 miles per hour. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so that is how you calculate. You can calculate how fast Earth is moving in its orbit by observing the spectrum of the distant star. So um, and technically, you are measuring uh, how fast the rel so the star could be actually moving relative to the solar system. And um, what you are measuring here, taking the um, kind of using the average and taking the difference between the extremes and the average. You are in that process, you kind of cancel out whatever the velocity of the star is. So, uh, so yeah, let's wrap it up with a couple of follow up questions. Uh, the first one is uh, asking you to make sure that you understand what blue shift uh, or how the Doppler shift occurs uh, uh, depending on the relative motion. So, when the Earth is moving towards the star, that's when we expect a blue shift to occur. Blue shift is shift of the wavelengths towards the 
blue, shorter end of the spectrum. So um, the second thing here should be B because that's when the wavelength we measure is shorter. Uh, when the Earth is moving away from the star, that's when we expect red shift to occur or shift to the wavelength to the longer end. So that should be the first one. By the way, I think these orders are randomized, so it won't always be A, B, although there's a 50% chance of that occurring, I think. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, um, yeah, so. So yeah, I think that's it. Um, yeah, this is the last one. Um, should I just give the answer? <laughs> um, I think this is one of those questions that are not, uh, that's poorly asked in, um, in multiple choice format, because it's really about error analysis and there's uh, quite a bit of, um, thought process that should be occurring. I would have loved to ask this in an essay format, but essays I have to grade manually. So <laughs> so let me just to check the answers. Um, and I guess if you have any questions, shoot me a message and I'm happy to kind of explain. I will just uh, um, tell you what I think are the potential effects that could be important or that could affect our measurement. So the first one, I'm not gonna check. This is sort of our assumption that laws are universal. Like, like if that were true, I don't know how we would even check it. So we assume that's not true. We assume that laws we have applies elsewhere. And so far we haven't seen anything that contradicts that assumption. So we don't worry about that. <laughs> the star might be a variable star with a periodic shift change. Term. Okay, that I guess could happen. Um, I don't know if there's, can't think of any physical mechanism at the moment, but hey, so what this is getting at is um, there could be a shift in spectrum that's not associated with the Earth's motion. And yeah, maybe we don't control the the, the original star. <laughs> um, if the star is part of a binary system, the star itself might be undergoing an or Yeah, okay, so this could be one of the ways in which this could happen. And um, if the relative velocity between star and the earth is changing on a time scale that's a short compared to a year, then, then yeah, that definitely could happen. So um, now if these are the kind of things that could affect our measurement, then I think, hope you give it some thought. What could we do to um, kind of discriminate that effect? What could we do to figure out which part of the variation of the wavelength we see is due to Earth's motion, which is what we want, and which part is due to variation of the star itself? And that's the kind of thing that experimental scientists all worry about and think of clever ways to discriminate it. And I want give away the whole thing. If you're curious, ask me and I'll give you some of my ideas on how that might be done. Um, the spectrum we observe might not be due to a star, but in, you know, that is possible, but I don't think it matters because um, as I describing the averaging process earlier, it, uh, it, uh, it what's important is that it's uh, somebody outside of the solar system and we are measuring our how our relative velocity relative to that is changing. And um, if it's interstellar gas, fine. We don't care if it's interstellar gas. So this is not something I think that's uh, um, um, in the middle of so select all that need to be checked. And I think this doesn't really need to be checked because um, we, we don't care <laughs> if that's true or not. Uh, motion of the instrument due to the spin of Earth or orbital motion of the observatory itself. Yeah, I guess to the extent that we actually want you to measure the half as the center of mass is moving relative to the star. Um, if we have a motion of other parts of Earth is moving, then yeah, that could matter. And this kind of thing, I think I would do uh, uh, an estimate of size of the Earth because we do know the uh, motion of uh, the speed of the motion of instrument or orbital speed of satellites relative to Earth. And what it will turn out to be is that the 
orbital motion of Earth itself is at such a high velocity that uh, these don't matter. But it's uh, something that you can do an estimate of and just to make sure that the effect due to this is either small enough that you can ignore it entirely, or it might be something that you correct for. Uh, yeah. All right, let me submit that. So, yeah, I mean, I do have a bit of an unfair advantage here in that uh, I came up with these choices, so I don't have to worry about <laughs> my thought process disagreeing with the question writer's thought process. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, so that's all. Um, this is the last of the feedback, because this is tutorial type. The kind of the Doppler shift that you will see mentioned in this module, um, you actually have to use this formula quite often because uh, speeds of the distant galaxies are gonna be comparable to speed of light. So, um, so this is uh, what we call non-relativistic approximation. Um, that will work fine for, I don't know, up to 10% of speed of light. But above that, uh, you really have to use the relativistically correct formula. Um, 